I mean, the first thing that's important to know is that while many people are interested slash obsessed with what they eat, the data that's come out of animal studies at least is it's far more important when you eat than what you eat. And this was a, a fantastic study a few years ago by my friend Rafael da Cabo at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. And he had 10,000 mice on different diets, hoping to find the perfect mix of carbs, protein, and fat. And it turns out that the only ones that lived longer were the ones that only ate once a day. And so that, if we're, we're not mice, but I think that we're close enough to mice that this tells us a lot. But okay, but I still think the best bang for the longevity buck is to do both well, eat less often and eat the right things. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, David Sinclair and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, get more fatty acids. Even with a normal diet, you often don't get enough of these omega-3 fatty acids, which are the types that we don't make ourselves. Um, if you're only meat and you don't eat fish, if you eat animals besides fish, you're not getting a lot of them. And they're, they're the building blocks of the brain, so we need a lot of them. And they've been shown in a number of studies to, to help with many different things, from wound healing and, of course, depression. Now, what are the sources? Well, if you eat fish, you're, you're probably in good shape. You've got salmon and mackerel, krill, sardines, these are good sources of omega-3s. And these are giving us the DHAs and the EPAs because there's three different kinds of these, right? Well, there are, there are lots. Um, but the three main ones that people talk about um, are EPA and DHA. The EPA is the more important one. Mm -hmm. You want to get at least a gram of that. Sometimes uh, people say get 1.6 grams of this ratio of EPA to DHA and women about 1.3 grams. And that's been shown to greatly improve memory and counteract depression. Now, that if you're a plant-based per person, you can't obviously get as much. You have to focus on other types of food that have what's called alpha-linoleic acid or ALA, which is converted slowly, not efficiently, about 10% of it gets converted by the body into the two types we just mentioned that are important, the, the DHA and, importantly, the EPA. Focus then on flaxseed, walnuts, chia seeds. That's where you get your ALA. Linseed oil is, is where it was first discovered, ALA, linoleic acid. I use that to polish uh, certain things, uh, keep wood looking good, cricket bats, you put it on there. <laughs> but you can also, you can consume a little bit, there's a lot of it in there as well. And there's, there's one other thing I wanna mention that isn't in that list of three, which is a monounsaturated fatty acid called oleic acid, which is really important. Uh, and I mentioned it earlier, it's a component of olive oil and avocados. And I have that included in my supplement every night along with these other components. Um, as a recent convert to seaweed salads, I would be remiss not to note that you can actually get, if one of the few plant sources you can get DHA and EPA from is, is from seaweed. Is that right? It is right. Well, I don't know if you get enough of it. I think it's really a good thing to consider and talk to your doctor about it to take at least a gram of these omega-3 fatty acids every day. So we know we should be consuming these omega-3s, but, but why? What are they doing in our cells? So it turns out these omega-3s actually form a structural component of the brain. They insert along with other fats in, in the brain. So fat is actually good for the brain. A lot of our brain is made up of these fats. The reason is that the nerves aren't naked. Much like an electrical wire, you don't have them lying around your house naked. They actually be wrapped with insulation tape or insulation, insulating material. And that's what these fats do. And these are membranes that wrap around. It's called the myelin sheath. And these fats actually, some of them, are omega-3s. And the more omega-3s you have in your diet, the more you'll have in those membranes, and that protects from inflammation and damage and helps the nerves function and repair if they get damaged. Rule number three, start intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting now is the most popular diet in the world. and it, uh, it, Hopefully it's not a fad because this is probably the most effective diet that's ever been promoted in, on the planet. Um, even for children, I'm not suggesting malnutrition or starvation by any means. But having three meals a day plus snacks uh, is a calorie overload for even for children in the most case. And you can tell just by the amount of fat a kid is carrying as to whether you're overfeeding your kid. And if you're if you have an obese child, and I know it's very difficult because in my family we struggle with this as well. But 
the effects on that child will echo for decades. Perhaps even towards the end of life, they will still have the memory, the epigenetic memory, we call it, of having been obese as a child. And so one area that I'm researching and going to be communicating about is the effects of our lifestyle, not just on adults and the elderly, but even on children. Yeah. I want to come back to that shortly. Um, but before we leave the topic of eating less, you said intermittent fasting is the most popular diet or way of eating in the world now. And you know, there's brand new blog posts, podcasts, YouTube videos every day coming out on this. Um, do you think of intermittent fasting as different to time-restricted eating? And the reason I'm sort of diving in here is, you know, when I see patients, I have to be very clear with what I'm asking them to do, you know, very specific so they really understand what I'm recommending. And I think for some people, intermittent fasting is one meal a day. For some people, it's you know, 16 hours without eating and eight hours a day where I'm consuming food. Then you also have time restricted eating where it's eat all your food within an eight hour window or a 10 hour window or a 12 hour window. And I think there is a little bit of confusion out there as to what these terms actually mean. So how do you put that together for people uh, if they're asking? Oh, I, I, I don't think that it's helpful to have these all these different names. It's essentially just eat less often. That's how simple it is. Skip a meal, skip the snacks. Um, so intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding, uh, to me, it's all the same thing. It's just uh, don't keep your body filled with food. That's pretty simple. Um, the amount of hours, the more you can spread it out. So 18 for me is is a good, good number. Um, 16 is okay. Um, you know, I, I eat within two hours, so I, I get basically 22 hours, which works for me. Um, but here's the, the, the really important point. Um, it's not complicated. You do what you can. You start skipping meals. Start with one, dinner or breakfast. And then if you can do that, then try to go longer. Um, it's not the, the other really important thing is if you try to do what I do from a standing start, you will fail. There's no question it's too hard. Your body will freak out. It'll feel tired. Your brain will be distracted uh, and you'll go straight to the fridge. You need to give yourself time. It can take a month to get there. And one of the adaptations is your liver needs to learn to put out glucose to maintain steady levels. So it's not like this through the day. And, and that takes, it takes a while. Uh, but once you're at the state that I'm in and your microbiome is optimized and your liver is very happy with its existence, then you, you will find it very hard to go back to eating the old way. Um, and you also generally look a lot better as well, which is a nice side effect. Rule number four, lessen glucose intake. So having high blood sugar is just known to accelerate aging. There's no question about it. But, yeah, but why though? Why? Yeah, yeah. why? So th there's a couple of reasons. The, okay. the, there's a, a very simple reason and a very um, I guess practical explanation, which is that the glucose that circulates in your body can be used for fuel, but it, it can also inadvertently get attached to your proteins. Okay. Yeah. And then when you've got this uh, glucose attached to proteins, they malfunction. So that's part of this buildup. That's why you want to have some intermittent fasting, mm -hmm. restricted feeding to turn over these gl glucuronidated proteins. Okay. And one of the, the ways to measure diabetes Yes. Is to measure the glucose that's attached to your hemoglobin, which mm -hmm. is an abundant protein in your red blood cells. Mm -hmm. And doctors take that measurement, it's called HbA1c, mm -hmm. that tells you how much glucose you've had in your body roughly for the last month. Because hemoglobin lasts the, in the body for about three months and it's turned over. Mm -hmm. And that number gives you a good idea of whether you've been eating badly and or you've got type 2 diabetes, which is the inability to utilize that blood sugar. And I don't want to interrupt you, but or trending towards, correct? Yeah. That's the big, is that not the big thing that most people that are going to go, that are having this monitor, they're, they're not probably at type two yet, but they're trending in that direction if they don't do something about it. For sure. And, and that's why it's important to measure it even when you're young. Right. You don't want it to be going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. By the time it's, it, you're type two diabetic, it's often too late. Mm -hmm. 
And so I measure, I've been measuring mine for the last uh, over a decade. Okay, now. I'll bet the vast majority of the people listening to this have never done that or, right. or do it once every three years in some random lab test that they do, right? Yeah. So well, well doctors deal. don't pay a lot of attention to it until you're old or mm -hmm. really obese. So you're starting to show signs of type 2 diabetes, which will accelerate your aging for sure. Mm. So that's one problem with glucose. It'll attach to proteins and make them malfunction. And it's a sign of type 2 diabetes. By the way, the numbers are based on the percentage of your hemoglobin that has glucose attached to it, stuck to it. Anything below 5% is really great. Between 5 and 7 is pre, and then uh, roughly, and then over 7, then you've got to you know, be, be worried. Mm. And your doctor will start to treat it. And one of the drugs that's used, we'll talk about later, I think, is metformin. metformin. But, but what's Im also important, I think, is to understand that there's probably another mechanism to how this is working, because it's not just about blood sugar. By activating this AMPK you mentioned, yes. Actually, I got to take it a real quick step back because there, there are three main things that keep us healthy when we feel hormesis or do hormesis. You've mentioned mTOR, which is sensing amino acids. Mm -hmm. The ones that I work on are called sirtuins. They measure NAD and a whole bunch of stress in the body, exercise, diet. The one that we're talking about is the third one, which is called AMPK, mm -hmm. and it registers the amount of energy in the body, glucose and chemical energy, which is called ATP, that mitochondria make. Yes. Okay, and as we get older, our body makes less and less energy, mm -hmm. and AMPK is the control system. And AMPK is activated by a bunch of things, which uh, include being hungry and exercising or taking the drug metformin. <laughs> and that's probably why they're all good for you, because it turns on these defenses. This is awesome. Okay, I'm getting it. All right. And so think of, think of your glucose as doing two things. One is sticking to proteins and wrecking the proteins, and you need to turn those over by fasting or eating less regularly. But also, if you always have sugar in your body, high levels, either diabetic or you're just eating cake every day, yes. or, or sugar in your coffee, what you're doing is telling the body, there's an abundance right now, and your AMPK defenses are not turned on. <laughs> Unless you take metformin, which might bypass that. Yeah. But what I try to do in my life is to turn on all of those three systems, the sirtuins with boosting NAD, AMPK by taking metformin and exercising, and then the mTOR, not taking an abundance of those three amino acids I mentioned, leucine, mm -hmm. isoleucine, valine. And together, I think they work as a system. We know they talk to each other. Yeah. And you tweak one, the other works. We don't know what the optimal combination is. Yep. That, that right. I'm experimenting on myself as a... We're depending on you, brother. The, all of humanity is waiting on you here. So let's <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, eat the right things. I will eat occasional, very occasionally a dessert. Usually I steal from others, which doesn't count, right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but you got to live life, right? What's, what's a long life if it's not enjoyable anyway? Yes. But what I've I also found, and this is, I'll get to your question in a second, but my microbiome right now is, and stomach is at a point where if I try to overeat on a steak, which I did a couple of days ago, I actually had a, a, a chicken, uh, a fried chicken specifically, uh, for two days I felt terrible. I couldn't sleep, it wouldn't go down. So I'm now at a point where even if I want to binge on meat and fried foods, I, I just can't, it just feels bad. Um, but what what do I recommend? Well, what the data says which I try to follow is uh, that plant-based foods will will be better than meat-based foods. And I know that there are a lot of people who disagree, but one of the facts is, well, there's a few facts. One is that people who live a long time tend to eat those type of diets, Mediterranean, Okinawa diet. They're eating mostly plants with a little bit of meat and not a lot of red meat. Uh, and the other fact is that in animals, we know that there's a, there's a mechanism that's called mTOR, a little m, capital T-O-R, that responds to certain amino acids that are found in more abundance in meat. And when it responds, it actually shortens lifespan. And the converse, if you starve it of those three amino acids, uh, in mostly in meat, then it extends lifespan. 
And there, there's a drug called rapamycin, which some people are experimenting with that does that. So you might be able to, you know, I'm just saying this here from all my colleagues, we don't know the results here, but you could potentially take a rapamycin-like drug and counteract the effects of meat mm -hmm. on, in the long run. Don't know, we should try that actually, we could do that in the lab. <laughs> but uh, getting to the bottom of this, what I think is going on is that just like testosterone and growth hormone, you will get temporary, maybe not temporary, um, immediate health benefits. You'll feel great, you'll get more muscle, energy, but the problem is, I think it's at the expense of long-term health and longevity. Well, this is actually something I worry about in terms of long-term effects or the, the cost in terms of longevity. It's very difficult to know how your choices affect your longevity because the Im impact is down the line. Like, just because something makes me feel good now, like eating only meat makes me feel good now, I wonder what are the costs down the line. Well, th think about what I, I was saying about the trade-offs between growth and reproduction, which is what a mouse does, and a whale that grows slowly, reproduces slowly, lives a long time. It's called the disposable soma theory. Um, Koch would just uh, propose that in the 70s. What meat probably does is put you in the, the mouse category. Super fertile, grow fast, heal fast. And then if you want to be a whale, you re should restrict meat uh, and do things that promote the preservation of your body. Is it uh, difficult to eat a plant-based diet that uh, you perform well under, so uh, mentally and physically? Just almost, I'm asking uh, almost like a um, anecdotal question, or unless you know the science. Uh, well, the science is still being worked out, yeah. but from the synthesis of everything that I've read, uh, I try to eat a diet that's definitely full of leafy greens, uh, particularly spinach is great because it's got the iron that we need, plenty of vitamins. I also um, try to avoid too much uh, fruit and uh, berries, particularly fruit juice. Definitely avoid that sugar high. Spiking your sugar is not healthy in the long run. The other thing that's interesting is we discovered what, are called, what we called xenohormetic molecules. Let me unpack that because it's a terrible name and I take full responsibility <laughs> with my friend uh, Conrad Howitz. The xeno means cross species and hormesis is the term that what doesn't kill you makes you live longer mm -hmm. and, 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 and be healthier. And so we're getting cross species health improvements by molecules that plants make. And plants make these molecules when they're also under adversity or perceived adversity. For instance, uh, I, I understand if you want really healthy or good oranges, you can drive nails into the, the bark of the tree before you harvest. Same with wine, you typically want them to be dry before you harvest mm -hmm. or covered in fungus. And that's because these plants make these colorful and xenohermetic molecules that make themselves stress resistant, turn on their sirtuin defenses, the sir genes, remember? Yeah. And when we eat them, we get those same benefits. That's the idea. And we've evolved to do so. This isn't a coincidence. It's my theory, our theory, that we want to know when our food supply is, is under adversity because we need to get ready for a famine. And so we hunker down and preserve our body. And by eating these colored foods, so I, practically speaking, if it's full of color or if there's been some chewing by a caterpillar, caterpillar organic, grown locally in local farms, I'll eat that versus a watery, insipid, uh, light-colored um, lettuce that's been, been grown in California. Rule number six, eliminate bad habits. The problem is we've built a world that's, that's very comfortable. And we were not, we did not evolve in these conditions. We are meant to be typically uh, cold and hungry. And in response to those adversities, our bodies fight back. And so what, the, pro the problem is that we now sit in chairs, we eat as much food as we want, we don't have to walk anywhere or lift anything heavy, and our bodies become complacent. Now, what was discovered is you need hormesis. What's that? that basically means the what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, and so what we do when we exercise and what, if we skip a meal, what we're doing is inducing this very ancient, very, very ancient, billions of years ancient mechanism that protects our body against decay, disease, uh, and the root causes of aging in an effort to survive. Uh, and so you really want to do the opposite of what modern life gives you.
Yeah. One of the things that you recommend, I guess one of the most easy to understand and simplest interventions you recommend for people is to eat less. And I think that fits quite beautifully into this uh, idea of hormesis, doesn't it, in terms of what eating less signals to the body and then what it causes the body to do afterwards. So I wonder if we could just sort of dive in there into why is eating less important? What signal does it give us? And then how does that impact the way in which we age? Well, there are, there are three main longevity mechanisms that we know of. Um, they have certain names. One's called sirtuins. There's seven of those genes in our body, and we've been working on them for 25 years. Another one's called mTOR. The other one's called AMPK. The names don't matter as much as the fact that they're activated by, by a bit of hunger. Um, to give you an example, in 2005, we, we published a science paper that showed, uh, which at the time was revolutionary. Now it's just considered obvious, but one of these sirtuin genes called SIRT1 was activated by caloric restrictions. So we found that animals that had been eating less and had low levels of insulin and another factor that's related called IGF-1 insulin, related growth factor, uh, that boosted the levels dramatically of this SIRT1 protective longevity gene. Uh, and then we showed that protects against DNA damage. Uh, and so what we do when we're hungry, uh, skip a meal or two, which is what I do every day, uh, it boosts up our longevity genes and they take care of us. Uh, we know that if we boost the longevity genes in animals, they live longer, they're healthier, they stay fitter for longer and they die much quicker at the end of life. And you know, I think everybody would know that in, in human history, fasting is considered one of the healthiest things you can do. Um, and so there, there's so much evidence that it's really incontrovertible that skipping meals is not only good for you, but will make you live longer. Rule number seven, reset your age. Before we get into what we can do today, just because it's a continuum of this resetting, what my lab and many others now are doing is, is racing to find easier ways to reset the age of the body. Gene therapy, it's here, but it's not gonna be you know, mainstream soon. It's always gonna be expensive, mm. hundreds of thousands of dollars of treatment. What happens when you can take a pill that will reset your age by a year? You know, happy birthday, dad. Take this pill. Incredible. And if you reset your age by a year every year, that's pretty interesting. Escape velocity. Uh, and yeah. And there are experiments now where people have reversed their DNA methylation age, which we can now measure, uh, by a couple of years. And that only takes a year. So now people are going back, at least their bloodstream is going back, younger than that year took them forward. Wow. So we are on the verge of something super interesting in humanity. It opens up all sorts of questions about what's the world gonna look like for maybe us, certainly for our kids. Mm. Um, but getting back to what we can do every day, the main concept that I think we all need to remember um, is that our bodies respond well to perceived adversity. Right? Those of us who you know, like to struggle in life, I know you're that kind of guy, it's don't give up, just keep going. Our bodies respond well to that. As long as you're not doing long lasting harm, an adversity mimetic, which can be don't eat so much, don't eat so often, exercise, be cold, be hot, there are some other tweaks to that. Um, high pressure oxygen therapy is another theme. These put the body in a state of adversity mimicry. Mm. And what that does to the body is it says, oh my goodness, I could be dead next week. I could run out of food. I could be you know, chased down by that tribe over the hill or a saber toothed tiger. I've got to hunker down and become more robust. And don't put so much energy into these other things, uh, you know, maybe wound healing would be one thing that you could take away from for a little bit and put it into long-term survival. Um, those are the, the roles of the sirtuins. Remember, the sirtuins do two things. They slow down aging on the DNA, but they also go and repair things. Mm. And if you don't have enough sirtuin activity or enough sirtuin proteins in your body, so in other words, you don't make enough of these little machines or the ones that you have are pretty inactive and lazy, or don't have enough of the fuel that they need to work, then you're gonna age more rapidly. Um, and when the crap hits the fan and you get a broken chromosome, then you're not gonna have as much ability to repair that and you might get cancer. And so what my role 
or, or my goal in, in my lab and in my experiments with my body is to make those processes that respond to adversity super active every day so that it's slowing down the aging process until we have the technology to reset the body and reverse it. Rule number eight, move regularly. Well, far be it for me to say don't walk and don't uh, move. That, that's step one. If you don't walk or move, then you're in big trouble when you get older. Um, so that's a minimum. But if we're talking about what's, what's not maximum but optimal, we don't know that for sure, and it might be everyone's different. But in general, losing your breath is important. High-intensity exercise. You don't need a lot. I just mentioned 10 minutes a few times a week. That appears to be sufficient to give you the, the longer-term health benefits. And what's probably going on is, in part, is that we, well, we discovered, uh, and we published this in 2018 in the journal Cell, if anyone wants to look it up, that old muscle starts to think that it doesn't have enough oxygen, even though there is enough oxygen, and it shuts itself down and doesn't make a lot of energy, and the blood vessels start to be depleted, and it's a, just a terrible feed forward process after that. So by making your body hypoxic and giving it a stress, both in the, you can actually do excess oxygen or lack of oxygen, just you just want to shock the system, then your body gets to reset. Um, and, and one of the, the most popular things to do in the longevity world now is, uh, what is it? High pressure bariatric uh, oxygen therapy. And that I think is also resetting this, uh, this problem that our bodies have where they are what we call pseudo hypoxic. Um, one of the ways that we could reset that without exercise and without high pressure oxygen chambers was using NMN, this molecule that I take, it actually boosted the, the body's ability to make new blood vessels. It restored the, the ability to measure oxygen in the muscle. Um, and when we gave it to mice, they could run 50% further without having trained. But the good news is, well, no, the important point is that the mice that were young and exercised and got the molecule in their water ran twice as far. So it's, it shouldn't be an excuse to pop a pill and not do anything. Um, but there are some little changes you can make. I lift weights. I have them around my house. I, I'm at a standing desk, which goes up and down here. These are changes that I make that, um, you know, I'm standing most of the day now. And this will really help. It builds the muscles in your leg and, and your butt and your back. That's important now, especially for a male my age, where I'm losing 1% muscle if I don't do something about it every year. But also the hormones. Testosterone comes... Uh, from having those large muscles uh, signal to the testes. And I've been able to correct and, and raise my testosterone levels just by keeping those large muscles in shape. Rule number nine, get enough sleep. Even at the molecular level, we understand that SIRT1 and NAD play a fundamental role in controlling your wake sleep cycle. SIRT1 and NAD are going up in the morning, coming down later in the day, getting your body ready for sleep. And in doing so, what they do is they turn on a particular gene called BMAL, which is part of the clock not the Horvath clock, but the daily clock, the circadian rhythm clock. And those genes tell the liver to calm down. It tells the brain to calm down. And in the morning, it tells everything to wake up again. And so what is really important to understand is if you start to lose the function of SIRT1 and have low NAD levels, you're probably not going to sleep well, but also you're going to age prematurely. And the big problem here is that sleep efficiency actually declines with age. So we got to work harder at sleep as we get older, just like we have to work harder at exercise as we get older to promote brain health. Yeah, another way of saying it is that as you get older, you lose your ability to sleep. And if you don't sleep well, you'll lose your ability to fight aging. And it's just a, a feed forward disaster. So you've got to intervene. You can intervene with the kind of things we talk about here, which is eating well, exercising, and intervening with the kind of things that you can take perhaps as a supplement. But now let, let's talk about what do we do to make sure we sleep well and we have the right rhythm. And mm -hmm. one of the key things that I use is NMN. NMN is going to raise NAD levels in the morning. I take a gram of it then. Uh, but I also, when I travel, I use it to reset my body. And I, I definitely feel that I can avoid jet lag if I do that. There's some other supplements that a lot of people take. Uh, magnesium? That's good for sleep. L-theanine is another one that mm -hmm. people try. I, I've used it. It seems to help me. Um, but essentially, you just want to calm down at night. Don't do your emails too late. Uh, relax your brain. And then I think a little counterintuitive 
one of the best things that you can do for sleep at night is actually not something you do before you go to sleep. It's something you do right away when you wake up. You mean go outside? Get well, you got to get you got to get light, right? You got to reset your circadian rhythms, and the best way to do that is put yourself in a situation where your body knows it's daytime. Well, you can, and it, but here in Boston, where I live, it, there's not a lot of light in winter, so I actually have some blue light that I can shine in my eyes to get my cortisol levels up in a synthetic way, not naturally. But whatever you do, try to get some light early in the morning because that always gives you an energy boost and helps you reset your circadian rhythms if they're not perfectly in sync. And like. The other things we've talked about today, there's lots and lots of research. We're not like just making this up. Sleep is important. We know this. Well, yeah, even in flies, flies sleep. It's a little known fact. But there were, before we get to the humans, I want to, this is a really cute study. Uh, it was a study that was in 2020 in fruit flies. They found that if you deprive flies from sleep, they have a lot of oxidative stress in their gut and they also have a short lifespan, which by the way, could be rescued by treating them with an NAD booster. Which is also a way that we've seen that you can rescue human subjects from sleep deprivation. But even just one night of sleep deprivation, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'll catch up tomorrow. I'll catch up the next day, whatever, right? Maybe I didn't sleep well tonight, but I can sleep well the rest of the week. One night of sleep deprivation increases amyloid beta production by 5%. That's, you don't want to miss with amyloid beta, right? No, that, that will accumulate in your brain. It's very hard to get rid of. And I was also shocked to read that it's not just the brain that ages if you don't sleep. We already know that if you restrict rats from sleep, they get diabetes within two weeks. In humans, looking at a million people this study from 2010, Capucho Adele, what they found was that in people that had very little sleep, the risk of dying was 30% higher than those that got a natural, normal night's sleep. And the thing is, our brains are getting so much adversity right now, right? We talk about a little bit of adversity being good, but we evolved to have a pretty low, constant low level of adversity popping up now and then. And right now in terms of sort of like the insults and injuries that we're taking in, in terms of stresses, daily stresses, everything changing, our brains are being besieged all the time. We need sleep to reset. It's just too much. There's too much to remember. There's too much to cope with, too much anxiety. We just are living through a pandemic. This is really stressful times. And just lack of sleep makes it worse. And physically, we will regret it decades later. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is learn how your body works. Let's go back to what is metformin. Yeah. Metformin is a derivative of, pl of a plant molecule that inhibits the cell's ability slightly to make energy. And in response, so they, it's they make acting more. on the mitochondria? Yes. So mitochondria, in high school we were taught they're the power packs of the cell. They do mm -hmm. a lot more. They make amino acids, they make fat. They do all this stuff. But we need them for energy. Without mitochondria, we're dead. Yep. Again, in 30 seconds. Um, and the way, and so I'm, I'm drawing this because they're like little bacteria in our cells. They float around and they make energy for us. In fact, like four billion years ago, uh, actually only one billion years ago, uh, mitochondria were free-floating bacteria that were subsumed by us. It's crazy. So we have little pets in our body and they have their own DNA, uh, which does get mutated over time. The reason um, metformin seems to work, one of them, is that it inhibits the ability of mitochondria to make the energy. So mitochondria are like a hydroelectric dam. Uh, there's water, but in this case it's hydrogen atoms, not water, that gets pumped into a reservoir, which is between two membranes on the outside of the, of the, the bubble of the bacterium thing. So now hydrogen atoms are really acidic. That's what acid is, lots of hydrogen protons. And when you get a lot of something, it likes to equilibrate. Remember that you go from a lot to little, mm. it flows. But there's a membrane in between from the high level to the low level. In, so internal is low, high is outside. And the cell puts this little uh, generator in between that outside space and the inner space. Uh, it's an outer membrane space and the inner membrane space. This is what we call it. And this little little power generator sits there and those protons shoot through a pore in that protein. And at the bottom is a, is a generator. It spins, literally, it, the protein is spinning at thousands of times per second. Whoa. And as it's spinning, it's doing a chemical reaction to make what's called ATP, uh, adenosine triphosphate, doesn't matter its name. That ATP is chemical energy that we use to, to live, to make mm. things, to grow. 
Uh, and so what metformin does is that it reduces the, the, the ability of cells to uh, make that, uh, those proton gradients it's called. And so you don't build up as much power and you don't make as much ATP initially. What does that have to do with glucose? Why do you give that to a diabetic? Well, what happens is that there's a process called mitohormesis. Mm -hmm. Hormesis is adversity. What doesn't yep. kill you makes you stronger. And mito is the mitochondria are experiencing adversity or perceived adversity. So the mitochondria are freaking out. I can't make enough energy. I don't have enough ATP. Okay? And what gets activated is a protein called AMPK. AMPK is a regulator of energy in our bodies that senses when we don't make enough energy. And what metformin does is it comes in and it activates that AMPK mm -hmm. step. And now the cells are freaking out that they're not making enough energy and in response, they'll make more. And so you have a little drop in energy temporarily when you take a pill, but then the cell rebounds and starts making a lot more energy. And you, you actually, mitochondria will multiply. You get more of these little bacteria in your cells. So taking metformin causes a uh, replication of your mitochondria. Yeah. Okay, AMPK starts, but I still don't know how this ties into glucose. Well, when you, <clears throat> when you activate AMPK, you don't just make more mitochondria, but cells start to put out a, a new protein that we haven't talked about, new to this chat, are called GLUT4, and that stands for glucose transporter number four, and it goes to the outside of the cell, right on the very, what we call plasma membrane, and it sits there, and now its job is to suck the glucose out from the liquid around so it. So it's no longer waiting for insulin to come around to push the glucose into the cell. It's like, yo, I need glucose to help with this energy creation. It does, and it, so it makes more of this protein, but it also becomes what we call insulin sensitive. So mm -hmm. the little bit of insulin that you have around if you're a type two diabetic um, works better. Okay, you get more insulin receptor, which is the protein that senses insulin. So all in all, what happens to that cell, just to summarize, because it's a bit complicated, is that by tricking the cell into thinking it doesn't have enough energy, it panics, adversity, hormesis, and it'll go now and put the protein on the surface to grab the glucose and be more sensitive to the hormone, insulin, that tells the cell to suck it in. Why is that good? Because then your glucose levels in your bloodstream will come down and you're no longer type two diabetic. There are two reasons, I believe, why being type 2 diabetic accelerates aging, why you don't want to have high levels of glucose, and why I try to keep my and levels And you think high insulin is, is irrelevant in this chain? I do. It's a signaling molecule. Okay. Um, I mean, over time, your pancreas will suffer because it has to make more and more of it. But that's not what's aging your brain and your muscle and all these other things. What's going on is two things. One is that, that glucose will attach to proteins uh, all the time. It just sticks to it. And in fact, the diagnosis of type two diabetes is to look at an abundant protein in your body, in your blood that you can access at your doctor's office and figure out what percentage of that protein is stuck to glucose. Mm. Um, and that's hemoglobin uh, in your red blood cells. And if you've got 5% or less hemoglobin attached uh, to the glucose, you're healthy. And then you get 6.5, you're a pre-diabetic and higher than that, you're heading towards type two diabetes. And that's just all about glucose attaching to proteins. And glucose attaching to proteins messes things up. Um, and they can really not work well. But that's really not the root cause of aging, as I've told you. What's also going on is that the high levels of glucose are making your cells complacent. Tons of energy. Got lots of this stuff going around. The hormones, your brain thinks that it's good. You're swimming in treacle. Um, and so your adversity and repair systems, the sirtuins, they don't work as hard. And so your clock is ticking faster. That's why type two diabetics have other they diseases. They don't work as hard or they're lumbering under the weight of glucose that's stuck to them? Uh, oh, interestingly, both. So twins will get attached to sugar, uh, but they also, they don't turn on. Like they they get attached to sugar or sugar gets attached to them? Sugar gets attached to them. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what's also a real problem is that that adversity system is complacent. And so by keeping your glucose levels down, even at a young age, well, I'm not young, but even at a young age, um, your, your body will be in this adversity state versus abundance. And that can explain why type two diabetics are older when you measure it, 
and also are susceptible to heart disease, um, um, dementia, and even certain types of cancer, and why metformin, the drug that keeps your glucose levels down and activates this mitohormesis defense, doesn't just protect you against type 2 diabetes. It, by looking at tens of thousands of patients who have, that have taken metformin, they also have lower levels of heart disease, dementia, frailty, and cancer. Now that we sort of set the stage for when we eat, which is really important, when we eat, we still have to acknowledge we have to eat sometimes. Somebody's going to, you know, sometimes you're going to, if you intermittently fast, um, if you're going, you know, 20 hours without food, you're going to have breakfast or you're going to have dinner. Um, so yeah, there's going to be something on your plate. It's really important also what's actually on your plate. And that's what this next half of this episode is about is what we should eat when we are eating. Um, and maybe the best way to start this really though is to talk about what definitely shouldn't be, or not definitely shouldn't. There should be a lot less of on that plate. Right, well, the, the big killer is sugar. Yeah. Um, glucose, particularly fructose is also pernicious. And if you give animals lots of glucose, um, and especially fructose, they will get fatty liver disease, they'll get diabetes. It's really bad. And this one and is it, like absolutely not controversial, right? Like we're going to talk about meat later and people are going to be like really up in arms. But if you say like the big killer is sugar, there's not like a group of people that's going to come hunt us down. Like sugar is bad. It is. And, and, and you, why? why? Well, why? Well, there are two reasons that glucose is bad when it spikes. Three, if you include the brain fog. But let's just talk about physiology here. Uh, one is that you're going to have glucose attached to proteins that makes them glum up. Think of it like caramelized body parts. This will ultimately lower your longevity, reduce your longevity, give you type, type, type 2 diabetes and probably cardiovascular disease on top of that. So that's one, keep those glucose levels down. But also what glucose is going to be doing to you at high levels is shutting off those protective mechanisms. Remember, particularly AMPK and the sirtuins, they get switched off by sugar. So by having that up for most of the day, if you're eating three meals plus snacks, your defenses against disease and aging are going to be working at a minimum. So instead, keep those glucose levels low and consistent. You won't get the brain fog. You'll get fewer proteins modified that'll lead to disease. And thirdly, importantly, you'll actually stimulate your body's natural defenses against disease and aging. So sort of like the, the first step, sugars, Let's get rid of the sugars. Yeah, on that note, by the way, yeah. I gave up dessert at age 40, though occasionally I steal it and it doesn't count if you steal it, right? No, I, th I think there's like a special little pocket it goes into that doesn't count yeah, against it's invisible. Your, right? Inside tracker doesn't pick it up. Right, well, well here's, here's the point. Um, you can quit something, but you don't have to be draconian about it. I still like to steal a, little, you know, a few scoops of ice cream if I see it, but I'm not gonna eat a giant bowl of ice cream every night. That's you know, a quick way to, to short a lifespan. We're not trying to ruin everybody's joy. No, not at all. Often when I give talks at dinners, people skip dessert after I'm, I've spoken. I feel bad about that. Well, you, you remember we were talking about doing an experiment where we would, we would have a conversation around a table with people and then have the servers come with like a birthday cake or something and just <laughs> like watch them. We still should do that. Uh, but yeah, so glucose is a bad one. Um, something else to avoid is super high protein uh, because mTOR... It, it can be activated, but you don't want it activated all the time because it's not going to turn on the autophagy, the defenses to recycle proteins. And this one is going to piss a lot of people off. Well, yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of people who believe that carnivore diets are the best for longevity. And for, for, for some people, a lot of aminos are appropriate. Well, certainly if you're an athlete or you want to bulk up, there are short-term gains. You'll feel better if you eat meat. You'll obviously have the protein to build up that muscle. But we can go through the evidence. When you look at populations of what they eat and how long they live, as well as the short-term effects when you eat a high protein uh, carnivorous red meat-based diet, those changes are, will be good in the short run. But long-term, there's no evidence. In fact, I would say there's counter evidence to that being beneficial for longevity if that's your goal. And that's because of the inhibition of TOR. In large part, yes. The sirtuins will also get switched off by high protein as well. The, so aminos are important. We have to have them. If we don't have them, we die. But you can get aminos from plants as well as from animals. Yeah, it, it, 
it's funny when I say I've gone vegetarian recently, which is a where fact. Where are you going to get your protein? Yeah, where do you get protein yeah. from? Well, what do you think plants made of? It's, it's also mostly protein. Now, they're not as bioavailable, so you're getting like two thirds the amount as you would from a steak. Your body has equivalent. to work a little harder for it. Great. Yeah. I want my body to work harder. It's good for it. It burns energy. And it's also activating these defenses, as we mentioned. So I, I'm now trying out this uh, a full vegetarian diet. I'm not yet vegan, but that actually probably works even better for longevity, as the science will tell. How come that sleep isn't a hormesis stressor like fasting or exercise? Well, it's an it's anti hormesis. Um, it's it's necessary for for long life and health. There's no question about that. Um, you mean a lack of sleep? Why doesn't yeah, that work? Yeah, yeah. Why can't you? Because you're saying fast. It's uncomfortable. It makes you feel. It, it makes you live longer. We're in scary mode. We need to extend our life, or else we might not be able to reproduce before we die. So, knuckle down. And the same thing goes for exercise. You're under stress. Why not just? Why why isn't sleep or a lack of sleep have the same impact? That's a really, 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 really good question. No one's ever asked me that. But the answer is that the <laughs> longevity the longevity gene that we study that's really we think it's really important for uh, for human longevity too is part of the the circadian clock. And when you mess that up, either through lack of sleep, jet lag, or just aging, which diminishes the clock's ability to form high peaks and low peaks. Um, then it, it, it impacts your longevity probably because it's affecting uh, your ability to fight disease through longevity defenses. But it's a, it seems to be a positive feedback problem, which is that if you don't get enough sleep, you screw up your aging and then you age and aging screws up your sleep. And by the time you're elderly, you're not sleeping well uh, and uh, you, you probably you're, you're under this accelerated aging program. Um, interestingly, that. I talk a lot about NAD, which is part of my research, controls this CERT-1 defense system. And the levels go down as you age, but they also go up and down during the day. As you're waking up, you start to make more NAD. And if you disrupt that NAD level, you disrupt your sleep. And so that's why I tell people if they're going to boost their NAD levels, do it coincident with the clock as it's rising, hit it then, which is in the morning. Because I know from experience that if you take it late at night, you're going to bump up your body, make it think that it's the morning, uh, and you'll you'll have trouble sleeping. Eat less often. Those three words, eat less often. That is the one thing that will have the biggest impact on your longevity based on all the science we'll talk about today. Okay. And and this means, this doesn't mean eat fewer calories it necessarily. Can, it can, and that's good. To, yes. That's good. But a lot of people struggle to do that to eat fewer calories? Well, it comes naturally. If you're down to one meal a day, which I am now, uh, you shed weight and then you, 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 know, you get your 20-year-old body back. That's a nice bonus. But then you, you maintain that weight. You have a larger dinner, which is what I do to make sure I'm not becoming malnu- malnourished. Clearly, we're not talking about malnutrition or starvation here. It's about packing your calories into a shorter period of time. That's because packing your meals into a shorter period almost inevitably means less calories, but it's not, that's not really what's happening here, right? It's not just about less calories. It's it's about what eating less often does inside of our bodies. Right, and we'll get to that. But really, it's not just about the period of eating, it's the period of not eating that's so important for boosting the body's defenses against aging to maximize longevity. And we'll we'll talk about how that actually works in in a minute. But you can still have a large body and fast and get the benefits. We've, in my lab, we've looked at mice that are obese and tricked them into thinking that they're fasted and they live just as long as a skinny mouse. So really it's about getting your body into this state of defense at any weight. Though I would say that there are certain optimal body weights that it's clear that if you're carrying excess weight, you're gonna accelerate your aging clock. What we don't want people to do is get the idea though that, oh good, uh, this, works even if you're overweight and so I can stay overweight and then as long as I fast a little, it's going to be fine. That's that's not what you're saying also. Right. There are certain body weights, uh, waist to height ratios that are optimal for humans is about 0.5. Um, but yeah, losing weight is, is helpful. We're, not, we're not, not fat shaming anybody, but we're going through the science. This podcast is about what the science says, not what's socially acceptable. And it is true that if you're a leaner, you will live longer. That is a fact. Um, it's not necessary 
to get benefits by doing what we're going to say. But also, interestingly, as a side effect of eating less often, you will lose weight. I did. I've shed about 15 pounds since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. And I look better. I feel better. Um, and it's a nice side effect. But ultimately, what we're going to do here is we're going to say, these are the kind of things you should consider in your lifestyle. We're going to help you get there. We're going to ease you into it. There are some tricks that make it easier. Um, and ultimately, you're going to end up with a lifestyle and hopefully a body that allows you to live decades longer. But I still think the best bang for the longevity buck is to do both well, eat less often and eat the right things. Now, I'll preface this to say, I'm not a nut about this. I will eat occasional, very occasionally a dessert. Usually I steal from others, which doesn't count, right? Exactly. Uh, but you got to live life, right? What's what's a long life if it's not enjoyable anyway? Yes. But what I've, I also have found, and this is, I'll get to your question in a second, but my microbiome right now is, and stomach is at a point where if I try to overeat on a steak, which I did a couple of days ago, I actually had a, a, a chicken, uh, a fried chicken specifically. Uh, for two days, I felt terrible. I couldn't sleep. It wouldn't go down. So I'm now at a point where even if I want to binge on meat and fried foods, I, I just can't. It just feels bad. Um, but what what do I recommend? Well, what the data says, which I try to follow, is uh, that plant-based foods will will be better than meat-based foods. And I know that there are a lot of people who disagree. But one of the facts is, well, there's a few facts. One is that people who live a long time tend to eat those type of diets, Mediterranean, Okinawa diet. They're eating mostly plants with a little bit of meat and not a lot of red meat. Uh, and the other fact is that in animals, we know that there's a, there's a mechanism that's called mTOR, little m, capital T-O-R, that responds to certain amino acids that are found in more abundance in meat. And when it responds, it actually shortens lifespan. And the converse, if you starve it of those three amino acids, uh, in mostly in meat, then it extends lifespan. And there, there's a drug called rapamycin, which some people are experimenting with, that does that. So you might be able to, you know, I'm just saying this here from all my colleagues, we don't know the results here, but you could potentially take a rapamycin-like drug and counteract the effects of meat mm -hmm. on in the long run. Don't know, we should try that actually. We could do that in the lab. <laughs> But uh, getting to the bottom of this, what I think is going on is that just like testosterone and growth hormone, you will get temporary, maybe not temporary, um, immediate health benefits. You'll feel great. You'll get more muscle energy. But the problem is, I think it's at the expense of long-term health and longevity. And when we're talking, uh, you know, we've already talked about like the, the real key effects that come from eating less often to basically turn on this adversity mimetic effect. Um, there's another really easy way to do this, though. Right. And that's get off your butt. Just get off your butt. Yeah, it's not that hard, um, as we say, sitting here uh, doing this podcast. But one way I do it is I have a standing desk. So my butt actually atrophied. When we were writing this book, Lifespan, I ended up with a cramp in my piriformis muscle, which is the Wait, one that... Wait, you're, you're what? Yeah, yeah. I, it's, uh, it's a small muscle. Where is it? Size doesn't matter. It's right in your hip. It goes through that hole in your pelvis. Yeah. And it's essential for standing. And it was oh, I always cramped wondered up. what that hole was for. Yeah. It's, There's a muscle it's, that goes through it? Yes. Okay. All right. And then, so the boat was cramped up on my left-hand side. So I was limping for about nine months after we wrote the book. And I thought, oh, gr great. You know, I'm writing about health and longevity and I've now crippled, crippled myself. I eventually got it to go away with a combination of exercise, physio, and an injection of NAD in my butt, which we'll get to in probably the next episode. But the point here is that sitting down is bad for us. You atrophy, you have less muscle, which means your hormone levels, particularly testosterone will go down um, and you become you know, in pain. That's not a good thing. But ultimately, if you have not a lot of muscle in your hips, particularly, you can break your bones when you fall over, when you're older. And all of that means you need to get off your butt, stand up, even better, go for a walk. Even better, go for a run or cycle to get what we call a hypoxic state going. Your body needs to suck in more oxygen. And that has remarkable health benefits. And we really have to work hard at this because, I mean, you're saying this as we're sitting in these chairs, right? A couple of days after I sat down in a chair for a long time in an airplane to get here, right? We've got a nice comfy couch over there that we've been working on. Like, we actually have to actively like pursue opportunities to do this, to get this, to get exercise, to promote this adversity mimetic effect 
because our lives are built around comfort and sedentariness. Yes, yeah. that's true. And what I think most people don't appreciate is that exercise isn't just beneficial for your fitness and for your vitality. It actually can stop diseases in their tracks. Um, exercise can slow down cancer. In fact, it can prevent up to 23% of all cancers from occurring. Um, that's true for cardiovascular disease. In fact, it has an even bigger effect on that, 30% reduction just by doing moderate exercise every week. 50 minutes is, is sufficient or three times a week with 10 minutes. All cause mortality, right? So what we are, all cause mortality is, based, mortality is basically slowing down aging. That's a 27% reduction in the rate of aging just by exercising. The thing that you just said, I, I love this idea of, of connecting the idea of all cause mortality with aging because as we've presented here, as you've been arguing for quite some time, um, most diseases um, which bring us toward the end of our lives are really just an accumulation of the symptoms of aging. And so if you bring down the disease rate across various diseases, which is bringing down all-cause mortality, you're really you, just, it's just a, a, another way of saying we're bringing down aging. We must be, exactly. And we can also now measure that with the biological clock, the so-called Horvath clock, named after my good friend, Steve Horvath. That is now a measure of the process that leads to all of these diseases that kill us. And one way that we know for a fact to slow down the ticking of that biological clock is exercise. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Dr. Alan Goldhammer, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. If you want to get the rewards, you have to pay the price. Sometimes results are proportional to effort. You want to put the extra effort in, you'll get the extra results. It's not a necessary component for most people to achieve a high